15, 16 episodes of this show. I had a good long Hi, everybody. Ronald Nesty from Rock and Roll Heaven. We have a lot of theater located in St. Charles, Illinois, alongside of Chicago. And in Bayland, we have artists on lockdown. Our regular show each week, we focus some of the greatest names, biggest icons, and legends in rock and roll in front of the mic, behind the mic, and tonight behind the drums. We've got with us a very, very special individual, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about him in a minute but before we do that got to bring on our co-host my co-host my big brother talk about a drummer legend rock and roll icon this guy has been touched so many lives professional and others i mean it's been an honor to work with him let's bring him to the uh the camera carmine a piece from vanilla fudge rod stewart jeff Beck, and hundreds of other incarnations what's up carm Hey man, how you doing? Good to well, see. You. I love the purple. I love the purple there. Yeah, look at that. And I got all the purple in there, and I'm I'm rocking again. You look. I'm just. Great, try, I'm trying to find out if I can go in a pool with this stuff, or is it all going to come out? That is going to be interesting. A little purple water, I guess. Yeah, I know. Up, it's well. It's more than. It's better than blue hairs, I guess, out in Florida where you're at. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of blue. Period. But, well, we uh, can, um, our buddy we're going to bring on now is in Florida. He's right down the street, and we're going to actually get together physically. I, can't, you know, all these people you've had on there, they're either one of two things: either from Brooklyn, he's from Jersey though, but they're either yeah. from Brooklyn or they're living in Florida. And uh, right. that's going to be amazing. You got to you, once this thing is over, you've got to put together some major, you know, party with all those these celebrities down in Florida that you're that you're with. Good idea. Once we get the house done, we're going to have a, a, a welcome party. I well, hope I'm invited. I'll come from Chicago, bro. You can, you can come. No problem. Well, speaking of bringing somebody on the camera, we'll wait for our little brother, Vinny soon. I mean, uh, uh, Vinny soon, yes. But let's bring our, uh, our, our just this guy. You know, you've been teasing me with this name for a while, Carm. And yeah, I am so yeah. excited because we've been trying to get him to the Arcata Theater for a while and his schedule being with Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, being with, you know, obviously he was, you'll know him from Conan O'Brien, but so many other ways. He's got a band called Max Weinberg's Jukebox. Let's bring him on, the incredible, oh my goodness, Max Weinberg. How you doing, Max? Hey, hey, my fellas, good. Carmine, Ron, hey, good to see you. How are you doing, man? Good I'm doing you. really well. It's good to be with you. And yes. I, I got excited. You played to keep me hanging on. Right. And, you know, Wow, what can I tell you about that? that? That was a, I remember the first time I heard that song. Carmine, of course, knows this, but the first time yeah, I heard yeah. that song, that completely changed my direction in, in drumming, completely. Yeah. I never heard, nobody ever heard anything like that. And the beautiful thing is that Carmine has continued to reach that level on the drums ever since that thing first hit the airwaves. And I'm talking oh, AM, AM radio, AM radio. AM radio. Yeah, we were. I remember when FM radio was called Underground Radio. Remember wow. that? It was Underground Radio. Yeah, w O R F M in uh, New York. I think it had Murray the K and Scott yeah. Muni. And it was all underground, and they would play the whole record. Oh, well, they did, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the first time I heard it was on a transistor radio, which is nobody even remembers what that is, but <laughs> groundbreaking. So it's great to be with you guys and. As Carmine yeah. says, he's sort of my uh, up the road neighbor, and now right. down in Florida. So what do you? Yeah, yeah. You got to tell, hey, Ron. You, he's got Max has to tell you about when he was a kid, when he hired Vanilla Fudge. <laughs> yes. He hired Vanilla Fudge. I did, yeah. Uh, so I, <laughs> I thought that's that when I met him. Hey, and what did you I pay? Tell you how I did that? Well, the Vanilla Fudge. You know, again, uh, uh, you have to understand how impactful the Vanilla Fudge were. The only place you could really play, there were a couple of shows. There was Upbeat, I think from Cle Detroit, maybe, I guess it was. And, but they played live on the Ed Sullivan Show. To get on the Ed Sullivan Show in the first place was a huge deal. So when I was a junior in high school, the... Uh, the uh, uh, school decided to form a concert committee to put on a concert 
And it took a year to get it together, but I got on the concert committee. Now they were talking 1968. I got on the concert committee specifically to lobby my other committee members and go out into the town in New Jersey, raise the money specifically to book the Vanilla Fudge. <laughs> and and by the way, I would get my band to open to the Vanilla Fudge. Right. Essentially, oh, they yeah. wanted to meet Carmine. Right. That was, you know, it was impossible to meet somebody like Carmine at peace. But I figured, well, if I book them or if I if I do something that leads to them being uh, booked and put on a concert, it was my senior year, 1969. I think it was May. It's right at the end of the year. I got my high school band to uh, to open. If I remember correctly, I think we got five hundred dollars, my band. <laughs> and. Uh, the, the ironic thing was the fudge were coming from Long Island and got, and got stuck in traffic. So we had we ended up playing about a two hour set and broke. Um, and then, of course, as soon as they got there and uh, Carmine looks essentially exactly the same as he did then. Uh, but I got to meet him and they were dressed outlandishly. I had a friend of mine. Um, a little subterfuge going on, uh, surreptitiously go up into the rafters of the auditorium stage. There was a catwalk and I had a, uh, a reel to reel tape recorder. And I said, I want you to tape this. And I had two microphones. So you need a bootleg, you have my band and you have the vanilla fudge. And their first song was, uh, I think the first song may have been break song, which was a, everybody, Oh, it may have been that or something. No, right. maybe she's But I have there. the whole thing on, yeah. on, on maybe, yeah, maybe that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I taped it on, you know, little tape. And wall of I, sack, I went wall down to Newark, New Jersey machine. and transferred it to a, what they used to call an acetate. Made out of black, which I still have, right? And uh, yeah. uh, so a great memory. But, you know, I immediately... I, I immediately had to have a Carmine apiece Ludwig drum set. So I sold uh, my first set and got that drum set, uh, you know, which had two bass drums because he had two big bass one. drums. Big bass. Although I did, as Carmine knows, I, I saw big bass drums. I got 24 inch bass drums, didn't get the really big ones. But the first time I saw the fudge was the summer of 68 up in the Catskill Mountains. And Carmine had his uh, Red Sparkle Pearl single bass drum drum set. And the sound was just unbelievable. You can't believe the sound. Just It was incredibly tight, progressive. You know, whatever happened afterwards in terms of groups playing that way, in my view and a lot of people's view who grew up in the 60s uh, who followed such things, Vanilla Fudge was the first, uh, you know, before Zeppelin, before all the metal groups out of uh, – uh, no one had ever sounded like that. And then take a Supreme song and turn it on its head like that. But anyway, I got the drum set and about three weeks later, my one of the bass drums got stolen at a high school dance that I was playing at. Uh -huh. And I couldn't afford to get another bass drum. So I just learned how to try to do everything on one bass drum. I, I don't think it worked out that well, but uh, it, I still have that set. I used that set on the, uh, every record I made with the, Bruce and the E Street Band in the 70s, and then Born in the USA, I used that drum set. Wow, Carmen. I didn't know that. No, that's great. I used to, I love that drum sound on that record, especially on that I mean, track. Yeah, yeah well, that was uh, just the two shore microphones literally up in the ceiling and that drum set. Wow, unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, so very, a lot of fond memories. Saw the band play at the Action House. But you know, uh, yeah. I saw Cactus. What's amazing is the, uh, since I now have another opportunity to talk about my friend and hero, drum hero, Carmine at Peace, was that he was able to continue that. That's one of the hardest. Bands are always breaking up. But he carved out a unique career in drumming, you know, by writing the first rock drum book, by playing, by, by songwriting, singing, singing drummer, people. Yeah, you know, singing drummer. That was me. Drummer. And, uh, you know, he got that microphone. Hey, I, I, hold on, Max. I, I'm not going to be able to walk out of this room here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, that'll fit. You know, That's right. Member, 
I know yeah. more about Carmine than he knows about himself as a fan, as a you know, sixteen year old. He does. Fan. He does. But here we are, all these years later. Hey, hey, hey! He also sent me. He also, Ron. He also sent me the actual poster for that gig really? in the mail, and I still yeah. have it. I have it here in my yeah, studio, awesome right there. I think what we should do is just make this the Ron and Max show and have Carmine as our guests. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we should do. <laughs> I have fun with that, you know. But that's, you know, that, but, uh, and that's what I was saying earlier, uh, Max. I mean, I've been doing this with him 15, I don't know, was it 16, I think, Carm, 16 episodes? Yeah, something like that, yeah. And it's just incredible how many lives, professional and other words, otherwise, he and his brother, Vinny, have touched. Um, it, it's just, it just blows my mind. Everybody, and everybody says some, just some wonderful things about the, uh, the peace apathy combo there. And um, I'm excited to be a part of it. But anyway, back enough about us. Let's talk about you. <laughs> did you, uh, did you, did you show him your t-shirt? Yeah. He I loved it. The t -shirt. Uh, right. Yeah. The, the record I did when I was leading the band on the late night program. Oh, is <laughs> I'm late. <laughs> You're We're late. Where here, are so. you? I'm in Thousand yeah, Oaks. We're really setting up for uh, tomorrow. We're doing a big video. Ah. Hey, Max. Say hi to Max, Vinny. Hey, Vinny. Yeah, how you doing, Max? Hi, I'm how doing great. Good to see you again. You know. You too, man. yeah. I saw you at the fan oh, my fantasy family. Family. From one family, the Peace Brothers. I mean, that's pretty That's pretty amazing. I saw Vinny yeah. do a record. I think you did this record with Peter Gabriel. Did you do a record in the... Must oh, have no, been not... Early not 80s. No. Ever? No, 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 no. You have a what they call a doppelganger, a guy who looks exactly like you. Who <laughs> your session? You should That's have done. Impossible, because he looks like me. No. Well, maybe yeah, it was Carmine. Carmine. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it was me. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're just uh, Vinny, so, We're talking about your funny. brother and how you know, uh, one-handedly, single-handedly. So you must have been three or four years old. He did change the course of rock drumming, which went from, yeah. you know, the English invasion, uh, as, as you guys know, of course, but some people listening and watching may not know, uh, it was, a, you know, basically kind of what all the English drummers were doing. And then Carmine and Dino, Danelli, come out. Yeah. Dino was quite a different style. Yeah. Carmine comes out the first time I ever heard somebody do triplets between the snare and the tom-toms. I, that's the I showed him that when I was like six. I was six. <laughs> when he was six, right? You were a precocious young man. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. I know. He's, he's, he broke the frontier. It's uh, when when you talk about influences, and you know, uh, doing the research on you, I thought it was interesting. Obviously, um, Carmine uh, being an influence, and and you know, we always. Many times, obviously, on this program, we've talked about Krupa. We've talked about Buddy Rich, of course. And I found it interesting that one of your influences, besides so many others, was Bernard Purdy, who's a very good friend of ours at the Arcata Theater as well. Um, oh, yeah. What made you go down his road as being one of uh, uh, one of the inspirations? With Bernard? Well, yeah. you know, if you uh, – uh, I had the great fortune in – must have been – I was 19, so it must have been 1970. I had a friend in New York who was an attorney who was handling a singer who was a great Broadway star. Her name was Dolores Hall, and still is, I'm sure. I haven't seen her in a long time. Wonderful, unbelievable singer, soul singer. And uh, That's when they used to have Broadway. They, when they used to have, yes. Well, yeah. they still do until you know, recently, but... That's what I mean. New York was... <laughs> just a, 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 a unbelievable talent. And she did a record and somehow somebody invited me to this session. And I, of course I, I knew who Bernard Purdy was pretty Purdy. I'd heard the stories, but he was the drummer on the session. Yeah. And I was 19. And uh, so of course, you know, I mean, I wanted, I was looking for a way in and then, and uh, I also wanted to see if he gave lessons and he, and he said, well, he, he did do lessons. So I arranged at the age of 19 until I was about 22 to take lessons. Lessons wow. was an interesting uh, uh, tutelage, guys. His lessons basically consisted of picking up his dry cleaning, going grocery shopping. <laughs> really? 
<laughs> when you did that, oh you did that long enough, then he would show you something on the actual drums, maybe picking them up and driving them around. And I didn't realize it. I said, you know, when am I going to learn the funky stuff? Which we did get to eventually, but uh, it was his whole thing was to, particularly with guys my age who were just on the, uh, you know, we were trying to find each, trying to find ourselves. Uh, you know, I remember he said to me, <laughs> you know, the first thing uh, they all do is they talk about their girlfriend and what the problem is with the girlfriend. So we got past that, and he did show me about six weeks in. He showed me how to play the drum break in Rocksteady which then of course I worked on forever, but I had some wonderful experiences with him going to sessions. Uh, it took me to several Aretha Franklin recording sessions, the yeah, session nice. to, uh, uh, Daydream. And uh, uh, then uh, one time I, uh, uh, there was this phenomenal rehearsal show at the Apollo and it was uh, for the Aretha's live at the Fillmore West. They did two shows to rehearse that weren't recorded or taped at the Apollo Theater before they went to the Fillmore West. Bernard was the drummer, Cornell Dupree on guitar, mm. uh, Chuck Rainey, I believe it was, uh, Selden right. Powell, sax player, the guys who made all those records. And I got chosen to drive him up there and bring, and, and bring his drums and set up the drums. So I was his roadie. I was uh, I'm <laughs> 20 and it was a thrill. It was, it was an unbelievable story. You couldn't believe it. I mean, here I was, you know, crouching behind him. And then, uh, so on the Fillmore West, Ray Charles showed up. On this particular show, it, it, Ray Charles didn't show up. But King Curtis led the band. And I'm like surrounded by these monster musicians, just incredible musicians. And it was very exciting. And I really learned a lot. And I learned... The way he taught the drums, Bernard Pretty Purdy, was he didn't show you licks. He didn't show you rudiments. He let you absorb. He let you into his world and absorb his vibe. And he was, as he still is, at the age of, I guess he's about 80, uh, maybe a little older. And incredibly, I'm sure you'll agree, he's an incredibly commanding Tate Charge oh, drummer. Great. Right. Yeah. We, we used to do a thing at the NAMM show with uh, Calzone Cases. And, oh. and he'd have a little drum set at the, at the booth. And it was me and, and Bernard, you know, we're, we've been friends for a long time. And he would just get on the drums and start doing that, what he calls the Purdy Shuffle, you know. Just, Purdy Shuffle. Right. And he'd and just sit time. there and he'd just sit there and play it, get yeah. the groove going and, and, and he'd talk over it. And he, you know, he'd like shoot the shit over it while he's playing the groove. And it was so relaxed and so good. <laughs> Now, I was introduced to him by my friend Dean Parrish, who had a, he had a hit record in the 60s. He used to play with my band. Somehow we got a record that was like number 70 on the single charts. And the second record was a thing called The Skate. The Skate. And, yeah. And he said, man, you got to hear this drummer, Pretty Purdy. He's unbelievable. Listen to this. And, and he did all that boom, boom, gotcha, boom, jack, 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 boom, boom, jack. You know, in those days, nobody did that, you know? And I went, holy shit, what is that? You know, so I copped it from yeah. him. Oh, and then, I, then yeah. I started then I started hearing that he, he he's the one that did all that Aretha Franklin stuff and uh, played all that. And I was, whoa, you know. So when I met him, I was like a bit gaga about it, you know. Oh, I understand. I was that yeah. way too. And, you know, uh, uh, he, you know, that pretty shuffle, he does that walking down the street. Yeah, right. he just has a thing about him, and you know, of course, he. I actually saw the sign, you know, pretty yeah, purdy, yeah, pretty purdy. If you want hits, call pretty purdy. <laughs> exactly, heard and about then, that. Uh, hey Max, hey Max, what was in yeah. like the the dry cleaning? What, what was what was the clothes? Were the clothes <laughs> like? Yeah, yeah, you had to pick up the dry cleaning. What do you have? Uh, you got to remember, this, oh, oh, yeah, this was 1971. So it was right out of, you know, across 110th Street. Uh, uh, you know, just flamboyant, the wide collars out to your shoulder. <laughs> and uh, it was right in the time on the east, east side of Manhattan. And, you know, I'd go in and, and I would just, yes, sir, do whatever he wanted me to do, you know, to absorb his, his vibe and, 
Um, and then I, uh, you know, uh, actually my, my trying to get work uh, before I joined the E Street Band, uh, the fact that I studied with Purdy was my big credit. You know what uh, I mean? Like, uh, you try to pump up your credit. So that was my big, yeah, yeah. Like, the head of my resume was the fact that I, I studied with him. Yeah. You know, tell people I dried, I picked up his dry cleaning and went for his groceries, but you know, <laughs> it looked good on my resume. <laughs> and also, and Vin, Vinny cleaning. used to do that. Vinny did that for me. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that. Vinny, Vinny would go. No, he's still, I let he's Vinny, still dressed I let Vinny up. stay in my house one weekend. When he's, go job. I let Vinny stay in my house one weekend and he destroyed it. Off his book. Yeah. Well, that's what younger yeah. brothers do, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Me and my friend, <laughs> terrible. If any, where are you now? Where do you where uh, are you broadcasting from? I live in California near San Diego. Oh, and, you? Uh, yeah, so right now I'm up in Thousand Oaks where my drum company is located. And we did a whole bunch of uh, uh, videos and, and things for online purposes. And then tomorrow we're having a big jam with a couple of people that are sponsored by this company. So it should be fun. Well, Rudy, Rudy Saza on bass, Michael Badio on guitar and uh, uh, Melody, who sings in a new up and coming young band, Lily Act. She's an amazing singer. So well, we're going to play. We've all had to be kind of creative now with the uh, the pandemic and uh, very, yeah. uh, the lack of live playing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Very, uh, very and then I do a thing for them every, every Tuesday at four o'clock on Facebook. And it's getting bigger and bigger. And I teach. Crack jokes, tell some stories, show them some rock memorabilia. So I got this little show going, and uh, and it's through the drum company Sawtooth. They, that's the name of the company. And it's a great company, you know, and they make guitars, they make everything. So as you can see, there's yeah, they, in the they, room they, of guitars. It's a uh -oh. hell of a room you have. That's we lost Ron. Thing. We lost Ron. What happened? Uh oh. Anyway. Well, we'll carry, we'll, on with that. Yeah, we'll carry on. We'll carry on. Usually, Ron has good questions. Here we oh, go. There he is. There oh, he is. I had a bad connection or something. Hey, I Ron got, has I good questions and a bad connection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait. Anyway, but you know what? Speaking of great connections, we got um, another one. Your 1984 book. I know it was a while ago, but I mean, it's a tremendous book. Big beat conversations with rock and roll's greatest drummers. How about, what is one of the coolest stories from your book? Because you talked to all of them, from DJ to the, all of them. Well, unfortunately, I didn't get to talk to Carmine. I, I know. I was just going to say they talked oh, to everybody yeah. with me. So the title, Rock's Greatest Drummer, and the list is really a misnomer. Because in my book, Carmine should have been the top of the list. But it was logistics. You know, first of all, I never... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it really, I'm remi I really am remiss. It was called the Big Beat, um, and it was interviewed with uh, uh, Ringo, Charlie Watts, Jim Keltner, Levon Helm, DJ Montana, and uh, there were some. There were a lot of drummers uh, that I would have loved to have. I had to stop at one point. I also was writing it during the recording of. Uh, first of all, I'm not a writer, <laughs> so this this yeah. is took on a life of its own. If you know what I mean. It was like the longest term paper anybody ever had to do. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> what it grew out of a meeting I had with Hal Blaine. I was introduced to the legendary, 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 I guess it's too small a word for Hal. Uh, a friend of mine in LA introduced us, and uh, I, I met him. And just like when I met Carmine, I asked him a million questions. They used this white one, and they used the big old. Mentioned it to a friend of mine who said, uh, hey, well, you should write this down. You know, you're meeting these guys. And uh, that turned into the big B. And, uh, but as I said earlier, um, I am remiss because, you know, if I, it took 19 months. If I had kept going, it would have been, you know, 10 volumes. I would have revised it. But I was fortunate to meet the guys. Uh, uh, so many of them are not with us anymore. Um, uh, but it, it was uh, it was interesting to, to actually uh, to do that book. But as I said earlier, before Vinny got on, uh, Vinny, you know, I was part of a movement in New Jersey to book 
Carmine and Peace and the Vanilla Fudge. This, that's how I thought of the Vanilla Fudge was Carmine and Peace and the Vanilla Fudge. <laughs> no disrespect to, you know, <laughs> and, and the other guys. But, uh, you know, for me, it was like ah, all about Carmine. So um, change the direction of drumming, as, as I said earlier, that uh, yeah. no, you know, nobody had ever heard anybody play like that. You know, right. and being just a couple of years older than me, uh, you, you know, he was, uh, your brother was well versed in the, in the Krupa uh, style when yeah. the drummer, the drummer was the star of the band. You know, you had Krupa mm -hmm. and then he had 10 years later, Buddy yeah. Rich. And these guys were, they were selling the drums. They weren't just playing yeah. the drums, you know? So right, the, right. the twirling, the hitting the snare drum and doing the, I could never do that. I wasn't coordinated enough to do that. But I yeah, try. I don't do that stuff either. I'm, yeah. I'm, no, well, he's Gene Cooper. I'm more of a Buddy Rich. And the, whole, <laughs> the whole look, you know, the whole look with the rings and the, tur the turquoise rings and the Fu Manchu mustache, <laughs> which if you see yeah, for me, a he's record out. Down. Oh, my God. Oh, forget it. I mean, I was just. Okay, if you're yeah. going to emulate somebody, I'm emulating Carmine at peace. Uh, but I did but a don't record put him in your book. But don't put him in your book. Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm <laughs> conversations, <laughs> conversations we've had over the last 40 years is a whole book. I know. On your own. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, first, was when the book the first form. came out, when the when the book first came out, I said to Max, "How come I'm not in the book?" It's just, I can't believe it. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, well, it, 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 reminds me, it reminds me they took a, 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 a the fanzine of Bruce Springsteen, uh, took a poll of the greatest, who's the best E Street drummer? There have been four of us. There was Vinny Lopez, the original uh, drummer, then uh, uh, Boom Carter, who played only on the song Born to Run. It was the only song he ever played on. It was a good oh, one to play on. And then uh, uh, I came in in 1974. And then when I had a, a scheduling conflict with TV, my son came in. Right. He took uh, a poll of who was the best of the four of us. And I came in last. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, what can I tell you? You know, sometimes. How funny is that? There's my son. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Well, that's an old picture of him. Wow. Uh, uh, that's Jay, who plays uh, with Slipknot, a yeah. wonderful drummer. And uh, getting well, married. You're, lucky, you're lucky you got that picture. If you had the Slipknot makeup on, you wouldn't even recognize him. You wouldn't see him, no. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, there, there's uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, the loves of my life, apart from my wife, Becky, the East Street band. Yeah. Uh, there we all are. I forget when that was. But, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, certainly anytime you see big man Clarence Clemens. Yeah. Is a is a is a wonderful boy. You you're prepared for this show. This is like yeah, yeah, yeah. real real production value. This is real stuff here, dude. It's real. Uh, there you've got the dynamic duo Steve Van Zandt and Bruce, who met when they were 14 years old, and wow. they were the two guys who it, neither one of them really had friends until they found each other, and then they found each other. And that was uh, what uh, sixty years, almost sixty years ago. Yeah, wow, that's you know, cool. Fifty-six years oh, ago. Cool. And there's Jake Clemens who uh, who played who plays sax with us, and uh, uh, Clarence's nephew, who does a hell of a job in the band, and he's big. He's a big guy. Hmm. You know, Clarence would sometimes, when you're playing the E Street Band, it's a, it's a show band, so you really got to keep your eyes on the show, which is Bruce. So sometimes Clarence would get between me and Bruce, and he was so big, he would block Bruce out. <laughs> he was like, we, a total eclipse of the E Street band. Right. Uh, you wouldn't see him. That's so funny. <laughs> wow. So, I used to watch you on the uh, Conan show when you were on the Conan show. Well, that was a, you know, I did that show for 17 years. For, for 17 South, years. Wow. 17 years, I think something like 4,000 shows. That was Holy a oh, wow! You are prepared. There I am with uh, uh, my partner uh, Jimmy Vivino playing guitar, Mike Merritt on bass, and Conan, who is really a, a great singer and can, you know, really play guitar too. He, he's partial to rockabilly, Buddy Holly, Stray Cats, uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, J uh, Mike, you'll see playing bass there. He has an interesting familial history. His father was the bass player of the original Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers. Uh, uh, Jim, 
Lake Merritt. Nice. Lake Merritt, based on Mike, uh, literally grew up in Philadelphia with everybody coming over to his house, from Miles Davis to Charlie Parker. Wow. Did he has memories of that as a young young kid. Well, there I wow. am. Uh, that was actually... Hey. I, 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 hey. <laughs> funny pictures. I did a surprise... Like a like when Bob Hope used to run. Not that I'm Bob Hope, but you know you'd have somebody like Bob Hope uh, walk onto the Tonight Show. I did that at Conan when he was uh, had the uh, the the band still on TBS, and I was out in L.A. and uh, we kind of set it up uh, to do a uh, a walk on where you know his drummer gets into some mischief. He doesn't show up from the show, and I just happened to be sitting in the audience, <laughs> and that uh, was in. Uh, I was in That's LA great. because I was going up to uh, Sac near Sacramento or Bakersfield. It was Bakersfield to see the uh, Slipknot play at uh, Knot Fest. You know, they do this big festival. And my wife and I, yeah. Becky, we went, we flew out there to see Knot Fest, which is three days of unbelievable metal mayhem. It's really something. Mayhem. <laughs> mayhem. Yeah. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Great bands. Great bands. Yeah. You get to see you know, just young bands, established bands. Uh, you know, they they put on a hell of a show. So I remember when I came to see you in New York uh, with Conan. You hooked me up with the backstage and everything, and uh, backstage was uh, what's this guy, the tennis player who played on my guitarist record. I, I forgot his name right now. Oh, uh, uh, plays guitar, John McEnroe. Yeah. John McEnroe. Yes, John McEnroe. Yeah. Yeah. Back he was well, backstage, and we, we hooked up and said, hey, what are you doing here? Yeah, we yeah. Lunch. I'm just visiting Max. <laughs> you know, it was it was fabulous to be at 30 Rock in, in uh, NBC for all those years. And then we moved out yeah. did The Tonight Show for just a year. And uh, But it was uh, the, the way the studios are organized out at NBC, it's kind of like a high school hallway because everybody would take these shortcuts. So right. you never knew who would going to be walking down the hall. And, uh, you know, uh, you'd meet some really interesting people who were maybe on the news that night. My favorite people were the people kind of, you know, that I grew up with when I was a kid. The uh, Burt Bert Lancaster, oh, yeah. Kirk Douglas, yeah. met Kirk Douglas there, Tony Curtis, James yeah. Coburn. Now, these are names that you've got to be kind of vintage, born in the 40s or 50s. Mm -hmm. Or grow up in the 60s. Those uh, are all the guys that used to hang out with Rod Stewart in the bar in his oh, house. Tony I Curtis, those there all the time. He had uh, uh, Gregory Peck lived next door. <laughs> you know, it was like one of those deals, you know. Well, these uh, uh, Peace Brothers have played with more stars than I have. So, I mean, the yeah. boldface <laughs> names. I mean, yeah, right. You know, I basically wow. uh, uh, one guy. You know, yeah, but you, yeah, but you did a lot. And you, well, now you got very done. successful. A lot of people love you as we do, even well, though you know, even though true. Vinny's not in your book, you know. <laughs> no, I have to cut it off somewhere, you know. And the, the, as it turned out, all the drummers, it all led to Ringo. Yeah. And there's a picture in the book that was uh, so I did all the photo research, and I went way over budget. I mean, there was no budget for this thing, but I really wanted it to come out the right way, and. So I, I hooked up with a guy named Dejo Hoffman, who was the Beatles' official photographer back w when they were big in England before they came here. And they brought him wow. to America to photograph them. And, you know, the Beatles' photographs were very, for a long time, you only saw what they wanted you to see. And he came out in the uh, early 80s with all the outtakes of these famous photographs. So I said, I bet wow. he's got, he must have something of Ringo that was never used. Because everything that was in the book at that time had never been used, any of the photographs, whether it was Johnny B, uh, you know, who's a good friend of ours, uh, 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 to LeVon Helm. So I went to the guy's studio, and he was quite old at the time. He was probably late 70s, early 80s. I mean, for me, I was 30, you know, 32, I think. And uh, But he had all this just Kodak boxes everywhere. I mean, no, no waterproofing, fireproofing. And I said, well, I'm looking for a picture of Ringo that hasn't been used. And that's kind of indicative of, of Ringo, you know? And this is in 1981. So he took me into a, fire, a file room, a cabinet, like those flat cabinets. 
And uh, I don't think I've ever told this story, but so he had all these outtakes and there was a picture of Ringo where John, Paul and George were in silhouette. You couldn't see their faces. And there was a, a light on Ringo with uh, a star that was a, a reflection from his drums. And it was, and they never used it because he said Brian Epstein, uh, you couldn't see the rest of the Beatles. So they never used it. It was never published, but it was perfect for my book because the last chapter was Ringo. And, uh, uh, you know, and I asked him, the last question was, was there anything that he hadn't done in music? And he said, well, I, I, I would have liked to have been in the audience for a Beatles show. It was the one thing he didn't get to experience. <laughs> Where well, the rest of us did. Great uh, movie. That's the story of that picture. Hey, Max, wow. when, uh, when cool. the whole Springsteen uh, train started going, I mean, 1974, it starts to be, it starts happening. Um, did you actually see this whole thing start to, I mean, did you guys ex see it happen? See it coming, rather? This big, like, monstrous thing it turned into? Well, the funny, that's a great question. No. Uh, he was very, uh, he really, <laughs> controlled. he was very hesitant to fall prey to a lot of the early publicity that he got. And uh, even before I joined the band and he controlled it, wanted it on his own terms. What I knew immediately within 20 seconds of playing with him, 60 something drummers auditioned. Every, he played with everybody for at least a half hour. Uh, and I didn't know his records, but I was, a, I was a good improviser. I came out of a jam scene at the time, uh, which really was not what I wanted to do. I just liked playing a beat. Kind of, you know, I knew that was my forte and playing shows. I was a show band drummer, which is kind of a, all the drummers we admired, uh, Carmine, were, they all played shows. They were, you know, yeah. they, they came out of show drumming, uh, cutting a show, which was different than, sort of, you know, jamming and playing a lot different than just jamming. But um, but I could tell within 20 seconds, this guy really had it. And, and and it wasn't just the way he projected, but it was also at my audition. It was Clarence Clemens on sax, Gary Talent playing bass, and Danny Federici, the late, great Danny Federici playing organ. It was just the three of them and Bruce and me. But I could tell the way they were paying attention to him. That was really key. And you guys know what I'm talking about yeah. was that there was such a focus on what he was doing. That's like the hardest thing to get in a band mm -hmm. is everybody pushing in the same direction, but they were laser focused right. on everything he did musically and physically. And the way I got the gig, I didn't find this out until 20 years later. I was curious. Right. I never knew how I got the gig. I don't know if you've heard this story <laughs> told it a few times but when someone asked, but, so we're playing this up-tempo shuffle thing, and there were a lot of sort of accents. And um, he was accenting the accents with his body, which was kind of easy for me, because you know, if a dancer kicks, you hit a cymbal, or a comedian, or a rim shot, and I had that kind of, what they used to call legitimate drumming, right, Carmine? Legit That's right, yep. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> cutting a show, because I had to work. And uh, uh, I, was, I was young to be doing that, but, we're playing this song, and in the middle of it, he kind of went like this, like stop, right? Stop. Which was, you know, if you're paying attention to him, it was pretty easy. It was like, you know, safe, right? So he said about half the guys stopped. And he did it again if you didn't stop. He did it three times. And if you didn't stop three times, that was the test. So <laughs> I was like the 58th drummer, I think. To oh, man. And... They played all summer, the summer of 74. They didn't do any gigs. They played all summer doing holding auditions, open auditions. Anybody could kind of, you know, it was in the village, it was in a newspaper. You know, it said Bruce Springsteen East Street Band on Columbia Records, right? So I was playing in the Broadway show Godspell at the time. <clears throat> I went down there anyway. We stopped. You know, that was pretty easy. I was watching him stop. And there was a long pause. And then he threw out his arm like that. And I hit a rim shot when he did that. <laughs> and that's what got me the gig. Oh. Out of all the drummers, 60 something drummers, I was the only one who hit that rim shot. And wow. at the time he was the only guitar player and I didn't know him. You know, I, I, 
yeah, I knew he was from Jersey. I uh, at the first audition, I I didn't even I hadn't listened to his records um, because it said Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry. I didn't even bring a whole drum set. I only brought a, a bass drum, a snare drum, and a hi hat. And I, I figured, well, you know, that's what those guys used pretty much. You know, Tom. Well, the rest of your kid was at the theater. It was at the theater. <laughs> yeah, it was a Slangland set that I covered. Aye. I covered Aye. it in, in contact paper because I left. Mm. It there. <laughs> So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's too late to say long story short, but I, I do the rim, you know, he does the rim shot and he, I didn't know this at the time, but you know, he was the only guitar player. He wanted to put the guitar, he was getting a reputation as a hot guitar player. And, and he is, he's an incredible guitar player, apart even from what he does. He can play West Montgomery like nobody's business, right? If musicians don't know what I'm talking about, he's really very well versed, at, but, uh, is sing a songwriting and and a fun man. He wanted to get a guitar player in the band. But at the time, the first tour I did, he played all the guitar. So the sort of that stage business, he wanted a show band drummer. And I, you know, I took a big pay cut to join that band. But as Duke Ellington once said, a musical profit far outweighs a financial loss. And uh, it was 50 bucks a week we started. Hey, Amen. That's that's what we're doing here every week. Well, listen, you know, <laughs> a life in a life in music. We're having fun. Is, uh, we, look, we all meet the three drummers here, and Ron. I don't know if you play drums, or you know, if it wasn't for you, we, none of us would be employed yeah. with the great venues. But uh, you know, we meet people all the time who are our age who say, you know, I played in high school, I went to dental school, or I became a lawyer. And there's a little bit of, you know, bittersweetness about it. They may have had a great career, right, you know, yeah. thing for the last 35 years, but boy, you know, if they just don't know what it would have, you know, uh, uh, been what their life would have been if they had stayed in music. The ups and the downs. I mean, yeah. you know, you, right. we, you just do whatever you have to do to reinvent yourself. Yeah. Uh, to try to control whatever you can, try to make good decisions. And, uh, you know, uh, apart from all the fun that it is to play, I mean, when we get on a drum set, I don't care who it is. When you get on a drum set and you start to play, you're 12 years old. Yeah. You're 12 years old again. Yeah. If you can maintain that kind That's right. of kid thing, you know, because the rest of it is is hard work. And it's all it all makes sense. And it all all that. You know, the I, I always say I joined Vanilla Fudge when we called the Pigeons. Nine months later, we had to keep me hanging on on the charts. There you go. And, and we made it big. I said, why? That was easy. You know, and it was harder to <laughs> stay there. It's hard to stay there. It was yeah, harder hard to, to stay, stay there. there and keep doing it and keep being successful on that realm than it was to actually get there in the first place. Well, I say to people, put on the Cactus record with Parchment Farm. Right. And as a drummer, hearing that for the first time, how in the world is Carmine doing that? How is right. it doing that beat? That was like a freight train. And you know, when we did that song, we just wanted to do a song that was faster than 10 years after I'm Coming Home. I'm Coming Home, yeah. <laughs> I'm Going Home, right, right. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was like a freight train where we heard the... When we heard the recording, uh, you know, Les Paul's son engineered that. Oh, uh, yeah. June Paul, yeah, up at Atlantic Records in the studio there. When we heard it coming back in the studio, you know, when we played over the big speakers, we couldn't believe how unbelievable it sounded, you know. Because really, there's no rhythm guitar on there. It's just a straight ahead four piece band yeah. with the harmonica being played live, you know, right into the vocal mic. And it was like one one or two takes, and we nailed it. And when we came and listened to it, we said, "Oh my god!" And then the sound of it was like so that was the bass drums were just killing. My whole band. So I did a record in '69, uh, came out in '70 for Epic Records. It was called Blackstone. It was my high, basically my late high school band, and we all went down to see Cactus at Convention Hall in Asbury Park. I remember that gig. Yeah, we drove down, our, our, uh, our <clears throat> organ player had a, a Volkswagen bus. Uh, 21, 21 wow. Volkswagen wow. bus. 
which if it was restored now would be about two hundred thousand dollars. We all went down right. to the convention hall, three thousand seats. You know, we're just in the audience, and yeah. you know, we tried to get. You know, we kept trying to move up closer. You yeah. know, but we were way in the back. We finally got up to sort of where the the floor seats started. The sound coming from that stage of cactus, uh, you know, it was just incredible. And then you have. Uh, so listen, uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to to be with. The Peace family here, the drum, at least the drummers in the Peace family. And, yeah. Uh, you know, like somebody, and you know what? In our family, Max, there's seven drummers on my father's side. I didn't wow, know that. Wow, is that right? Yeah, there's, there's me, my cousin Joey. There's uh, me, then Vinny, my cousin Anthony, my cousin Frankie, my cousin Michael, my cousin Tommy. And Tommy lives here in, in Florida. We're going to see him tomorrow. Because tomorrow's my son's birthday. We're having a little birthday dinner at our house. And wow. Nick is here now, Vin. Oh, cool. All I know about you, I did not know that. Yeah, when you hear something? Their names just now. You sounded like Paul Sorvino. In <laughs> 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 scene. That was beautiful. Yeah, right? That's right. The cousin mom. Joey, oh, cousin yeah. Frankie, oh, cousin Michael, cousin Vinny, yeah. you know, cousin you, Tommy. That's right. The mom. The this mob of drummer. In New Jersey. Jersey, is, you know, the fact that Manhattan is in the middle of Brooklyn and Jersey, if you're from Jersey or if you're from Brooklyn, it didn't really matter because you can get to both of those places without going through the city. So there's a real kinship between Jersey and the area of Jersey I grew up in, North yeah. Jersey, you know, Newark, yeah. and Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. yeah. I remember, um, uh, Ron, you'd, be, you'd like this. Max yeah. has the original Ringo Beetle drum head that used to be on his bass drums. I said the right Beatles. Too. Come on, I was just gonna. And now the uh, the uh, uh, few people, <laughs> very few people know that I do. I have uh, now it's out really? there, Carmine. That you just yeah. made news, Carmine, uh, yeah. which is all right. Uh, it's number five of seven, and is that oh. Actually a drum story connected with it, and uh, ah. uh, Carmine, and uh, possibly Vinny too, you probably remember Frankie Polito. Yes, of yeah. course. Frankie Polito was a famous drum store owner in New York yeah. City. His place was called the Professional Percussion Center. Yeah, and right. it was on the corner of 8th Avenue and 50th Street on the on the third floor. And a lot of, it was it was the in, it was called the in place for drummers, right? It was, yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> I cool. bus into New York and get off at Port Authority. I go to Newark, take the bus to Newark, take the bus to Port Authority, and drive and and walk the eight blocks to Frank's <clears throat> yeah. professional percussion center. When I was, you know, 14, 15 years old. It, Ron just left, so I'll continue to tell you. He just went away. Now Ron just got his he froze, so whenever so here, somebody freezes, we get rid of him. So Frank, yeah, who was actually the drummer in the uh, Glenn Miller band in the late '40s and early '50s. Oh wow! I didn't know that. That's well, I didn't uh, know that. One of the drummers uh, uh, did not go. Thankfully, uh, he always thank God he didn't go to to uh, England with that band. <clears throat> uh, he collected drum heads, and he, you know, he was right down from the uh, down the street from the Ed Sullivan show. So they would occasionally. Um, Supply drum sets, uh, drum heads. And if you notice the pictures of uh, the rehearsal pictures of the Beatles debut on uh, uh, the Ed Sullivan show, in the <laughs> afternoon, he was playing a white drum set. He wasn't playing his blue, Black Oyster Pearl Ludwig drums. He was playing a, a backline kit set to, for the rehearsal, which was on, oh. uh, I think the rehearsal was Thursday or Friday. And then they had a dress rehearsal on Saturday uh, and, yeah. and a rehearsal on Sunday. So wow. they did get the set from Ludwig and they had their the hand painted, you know, drum head. That was number one. That was a 20 inch Remo drum head. So Ringo, during his career with the Beatles, had seven hand painted drum heads. He had two 20 inch drum heads and uh, hmm. five 22 inch. Hmm. The Frank used to collect, if you remember his back office, he had all these big band drummers, jazz drummers, Cozy Cole, yeah. and, uh, uh, Sonny Greer, the SG from the Duke Ellington Orchestra, 
he had all these bass drum heads hanging from the ceiling. And he had some rock and roll uh, bass drum heads. Uh, during the time I went there, you know, which was 65 to 67, I remember he had a, he had a Yardbirds head, had a couple of the bands that played on the Ed Sullivan show. So when the, the Beatles uh, did their 65 tour, they didn't bring their drums. Ringo brought his cymbals. Did not bring his drums. Wow. There's Ron. I don't know if you heard this, Ron, but I'm telling the story of this drum head. I heard it all. I heard it all. He named Eddie Stokes was a was a, worked at uh, Drum City in London, and he was also a painter. And the guy, a guy named Ivan Arbiter, ran that store. And when Ringo bought his drums there, the reason he played Ludwig was Ludwig. It was very unusual to have a Ludwig set of drums in England. They didn't have a distributorship. Everybody was playing. Yeah. Dixon, which was a German company, or Premier, which was an English company. Premier, yeah. Mm -hmm. but Ringo wanted a Ludwig set of drums. Uh, of course, Ringo put Ludwig uh, over the top, right? Yeah. After, you know, and they had, you know, as big as the Beatle name, the Ludwig name. So if you notice, through the years, the Ludwig name got smaller and smaller. Yeah. Brian Epstein realized, you know, I'm not pr promoting Ludwig drums. So uh, they uh, the paint would peel the paint would peel off. I'm really uh, yeah, extrapolating on this story, just expanding the how I came to get this drum head. Uh, and there are three or four that are known. Uh, the guy who owns the Minnesota Vikings, I think it is, bought the original first head, um, and another guy bought that drum set. Or I may have that backwards, but I know the the uh, his name is uh, Wilk. Uh, bought either the drum set or the original mm -hmm. drum head. In any case, fame. these drum heads, you know, uh, they were hand painted. It, I just disappeared. Oh, there's Vinny. Yeah, sorry. So they were yeah, hand painted. Well, disappearing. They, they got beat up on the road. They just paint another one. There, there was no value in them other than the, you know, the twelve dollars that the drum head cost and the five dollars they paid the guy to paint it. This was the guy who came up with the logo, the drop T and the wide B. And if you look at all the heads, they're all a little different. Oh, man. They're, all painted, they're all painted differently. So my drum head was only used on their US American tour the summer of 65. And when they got to San Francisco, they gave the drum set back to basically Frank Ippolito's sort of counterpart in San Francisco uh, to give the drum set back to Ludwig. And they left the head on it. So the guy out there had the drum. He had the uh, drum set in oh, his store. Oh, man. He sold the drum set to, with the head to Frank. Oh. 67, 68. Frank sold the drum set and kept the head. Oh. When I started going there, there was no head. But then in 68, I, I went back in his office. And, you know, drummers, Mel Lewis, all the drummers would hang out there. I mean, as a kid, I'd go there and you'd have, you know, Papa Joe Jones playing on the pads that were on the, you know, that were on the counter. It was a hang. And so, you know, he had this share of, of rockheads. And I said, gee, you know, uh, hey, Frank, would you ever, you know, sell that? I just noticed the Beatle head. I said, is that really going to tell me the story? Yeah, but, you know, the Beatles were still together. And uh, they did their 66 tour. They had other drum heads. There was no value. Uh, in it other than, you know, it was cool looking. And uh, he would, but he was really, you know, he hated rock and roll and he was really into having the big band. Yes, he had a, he had a chick web head. That was huge to have a chick web uh -huh. head. Yeah. And um, now I'm getting really deep into the, way, the weeds here. But so finally, Frank, <laughs> Frank became ill. And in 1970, it was around the same time the Beatles broke up. He, he, he became ill, and I uh, asked him if he'd, uh, uh, you know, again, would he ever sell that? And he goes, well, let me think about it. I went in there a couple of weeks later. He goes, hey, you want that, you want that drum head? Give me 100 bucks. So I didn't have 100 bucks. <laughs> $100 for Ringo's <laughs> drum. I borrowed the money from my sister's boyfriend, my older sister's boyfriend. <laughs> I gave him 100 bucks cash, uh, and he gave me the head. And then, you know, the Beatles broke up that April, 1970, and there was still no market in Beatles. There was no memorabilia market. So I always had this head. 
you know, and I paid a hundred dollars. I didn't have, I paid my sister back, but I had the drum head and I always had it on an old, uh, uh bass drum, like a 1920s bass drum maple, uh, that had one, you know, single lug across it as a coffee table. And I put right. it on top of it. Right. And nobody ever thought about it. And it was just, you know, but then of course, you know, Beatle mania or the Beatle memorabilia mania took off with rock memorabilia in general. Bill Wyman, by the way, is, is uh, divesting himself of all of his uh, everything. And there's a big auction and I think it's next week or two weeks, uh, his amps and the, the amp he had when he got in the Rolling Stones. Oh, God. I always had this thing and it's a little bit, you walk into my house and you, you know, uh, I have it in my sort of listening room and uh, you know, it. Uh, then I, I, when we were playing England, so I've always had it. I've had it since, you know, 1970, late 70. And um, uh, I even have the receipt from Frank. Later on, I got a receipt from him. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, uh -huh. So it became kind of like, wow, you know, he was my early drum hero and I had this uh, drum hit. But then when we played in uh, England in 85, Ringo had a party at his house and uh, uh, and I knew him by then really well. And uh, after the show, he played in, uh, in Wembley Stadium, he had a party and a bunch of us went out to his house, which was John Lennon's house. And um, uh, there were a bunch of, Jeff Beck was there uh, a bunch of actors, uh, and it was a big jam, but I brought, I had a little anvil case made for the head. I carried it around on that tour oh, no. and, uh, to see if he'd sign it for me. Right. Oh, that's a tough one. So yeah. I, I carried this anvil case around just 22 inches big, you know, with the felt padding. The <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I brought it to his house and he signed it to Max, Love and Luck, Ringo Starr, uh, and he doesn't sign autographs. He hasn't signed autographs in years. And then before that, for about 15 years, he just signed Ringo. Uh, but he, you know, love, love and luck, Ringo star with a little star. So it's sort wow. of something that um, you know inspires me when I look at it. And uh, because all of us stand on the shoulders of those great drummers who came before us. Yeah, I think uh, all of us like the Apiece <laughs> Brothers and uh, uh, and Mike. Hey. No. Hey Max, I I was at that house, the John Lennon house with Black Sabbath. We recorded Timber one Park. song now. The big, oh yeah, yeah with the, the white the white room. Yeah, the white room. I imagine was filmed. Imagine, right? That was the living room when Ringo yeah. had it. John only had that white piano, but he built that yeah. recording studio right off the kitchen, down a hallway. Yeah, that's what we used. Yeah, and that's after John passed, you know. And I got his room to stay in, but they didn't oh, take no it. Kidding. Wow, that's really I didn't take it because it was too freaky. He just died, and I was like, I, I don't want to go in that, you know, stay in that room. I taught, saw too many horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool to have recorded in there. I'm on a recording in there with this jam that Ringo, I'm sure, has. And they had Jeff Beck was there, Nils Lofgren, of course. Uh, uh, it was, you know, some of the uh, Clarence, I think, came out. It was uh, <laughs> one of those really, really late night jams yeah so, um, i think you have to be our turn up conversation i'm sorry hey hey ron turn up your turn up your volume we can't hear you oh, i'm sorry no i'm just what i'm saying is i think that max is going to be the only our only guest that we're going to invite back twice with so many stories yeah yeah you really know so because half the conversation got cut off by the terrible connection for me <laughs> I I'd well, love to hear these stories. I enjoyed, I enjoyed this hour we've spent together, uh, all three of it. I can remember yeah. uh, the mental image. I'm sure Carmine doesn't remember this, but we went into the uh, his, their dressing room was the girls' locker room in my high school, Columbia High School, Maplewood, New Jersey, and I cornered him in there. And you know they had the benches, you know, like by the lockers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I finally got him alone. It's eight o'clock. And, uh, and by the way, there was no sound check because they were late. They just went out and killed. It was unbelievable. <laughs> but I got there I, and I can I can still visualize myself, Carmine, sitting on this hard wood bench. You're sitting there with me and you are decked out. You are yeah. in rock star regalia. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like a little college crew shirt and yeah. uh, 
uh, it was one of the uh, most uh, uh, impressive and uh, for me at the time, I mean, I was 17, life-changing experiences. I'd never, yeah. he was the most famous wow. person I'd ever met. I never met anybody. Wow. You know, and then suddenly I was meeting my drum hero. So <laughs> you know, I'm in age between karma yeah, and me. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure Vinny, you looked up to your older brother and all your relatives who played drums, but um, which is something I yeah. didn't know. You come from No, I didn't look up to them. I only so looked up to Carmine, not my relatives. <laughs> well, you, you you looked up to the right guy because so did John Bonham, by the way. Yeah, yeah. You know, some people all these yeah. years later may not realize it, but in the history of rock drumming, no Carmine, no John Bonham. Oh, John, wow, that's a heavy yeah. statement. Thank right. you, man. John, John yeah. of course, John Bonham. Yeah. Well, I never had the pleasure of playing or meeting. Just, you know, what can you say about John Bonham? Yeah. But the Vanilla Fudge predated that and that heavy drumming and the triplets. And those of us who were there at the time knew what an influence Carmine was on Bonham, who was just a complete natural, yeah. um, you know, a natural and took it, took it his way. Yeah. But um, yeah. nobody... You know, even if you listen to uh, the early Deep Purple records, didn't have the kind of drumistic stuff. They were great drumming, but didn't have the little things that. Uh, yeah. There you go. Look at that, Max. There you go. That's me on the top and John on the bottom. Well, all right. Well, there you go. My point proven. The drum set yeah. on the top came first. Yeah. And, you know, it was most impressive. And uh, certainly, you know, and then Bonham went back to a single bass drum. You know why? I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. Um, that, that picture that picture you just saw was taken uh, on its 1969 tour. And Robert and Jimmy, after that tour, told Bonzo, you're too busy with two bass drums. Get rid of one of them. Oh. So wow. he got rid of one mm -hmm. of them. And the Led Zeppelin drum set was born on that kit. Oh, I didn't know that. See, there. Yeah. Right. That's really yeah. interesting. Well, all I can say is, you know, uh, I, I, I don't want to gush. I've been gushing, but uh, no Carmine, no me. Oh. Because that oh. was the direction I went in. Wow. Hey, no Carmine, no Vinny. Yeah, who knows? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No Carmine, no Ron. <laughs> Well, listen, you know, uh, it's true, it's true. You know, to be a soloist in rock, to be a, a you know, yeah. to be a soloist, uh, that, that's not easy. There are only a few, you know, who could really pull it off. And Carmine led the way. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know he inv inspired Vinny, inspired me. And, yeah. you know, so uh, you're looking at uh, the family upon whose shoulders I stood. Right, right. Hey, listen, I got to run back to sound check. Max, so nice to talk to you and see you. And uh, I will see you at one of our mutual dates. Uh, at some yeah, point. that'd be nice. Say hi to the guys, Vin. All right, will do. You guys take care. Max, take care of yourself. Bye, you Ron. Bye-bye, buddy. buddy. And Max, we can't thank you enough for really well, spending this time with us. I mean, really, the amount of stories. I mean, volume two of your book has got to come out. And at least this one, I know. Carmine will be a big chapter in that book. <laughs> well, it, uh, absolutely. And of course, Carmine's written his own great book. So uh, apart absolutely. from real, real is he was the first guy who wrote a drum book. This is a yeah. groundbreaking guy. So, yeah, you know, know. Ground. and hey, now so I will see you over the house here work. soon, buddy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to together. Soon. I got to thank you. Go, thank we're, you going to Del Rey. Rey. we're going to Delray tonight. With my oh, you are. Well, enjoy yourselves. We're down here in Florida where no matter what else is going on, the trees are always green. That's and right. That's the grass. <laughs> That's right. Thank you guys very, very much. Thank you guys. Thank you everybody. Great to talk to you. Sure, yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. Artists on Lockdown, hanging and banging. We'll see you next week. Max Weinberg, what can we say? You're a true legend. Carmine, my older brother, I love right. you. Thank you very much. Next everybody, week we got Bruce, Bruce Kulik next week. Oh, man, this is crazy. Yeah. Everybody like, share, do what you got to do. Tell everybody about this great show, Artists on Lockdown. We'll see you next week. Max, we'll yeah. see you at the Arcata Theater sooner than later, my man, with the jukebox. Thank you, Ron. Thank yeah, you, Carmen. Good night. Thanks, Max. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.